I'm sure everyone has, has heard of uh, St. Gregory's experience in the marketplace in Rome where they were selling slaves and he saw these blonde-haired, fair-skinned young men and he asked what race of men they were. And the answer was, they're angles. And so he said, well, with God's grace, they should become angels. And that was the beginning of the dramatic adventure of the re-evangelization of England uh, at the end of the 6th century by monk missionaries from Rome. There's a uh, biography of St. Gregory by a man named Holmes Duden, written in 1905, but... uh, perhaps the most complete uh, work in English. And uh, this author somewhat romantically remarks that it might have seemed that men whose object was to isolate themselves from the world and whose time was to be given mainly to prayer and contemplation were scarcely those most fit to be chosen for a long and dangerous journey and for active work in a foreign land. But St. Gregory had experience of the monastery, and he knew that within the cloister walls, more than anywhere else, he might hope to find the qualities that were absolutely necessary for the accomplishment of so difficult a task, that is, courage, patience, discipline, and devotion. Well, we hope that's the case in monasteries. Uh, As I say, it was a somewhat romantic beginning. Uh, We have very little information about St. Augustine of of Canterbury, although there is a a medieval vita by a certain Gosselin, which I was not able to consult. Unfortunately, our our library in Norcia is somewhat limited. I would have to go to Rome to find something like that, and I wasn't able to do so. But we do know that Augustine was prior of the monastery of St. Andrews in Rome, that is the monastery that that Gregory came from, And some sources call him a sincellus of Gregory, that is, a chamberlain and confidential secretary. Uh, St. Gregory knew him well enough to have great confidence in his abilities. And Gregory set him at the head, then, of a band of 40 monks. That's a pretty uh, sizable uh, missionary band. And they set out in the spring of 596... Uh, by boat, by ship, from Rome to Lerins, uh, where there was already a monastic settlement, of course. And from there, up the Rhone River, from Marseille and Aix-en-Provence to Arles, which was the metropolitan sea of Gaul at the time, and Lyon, and on up to Paris. In southern France, what we call southern France, the inhabitants there still remembered the horrors of Saxon incursions and filled the missionaries' ears with dreadful tales about the nation whose savage ferocity seems to have been their leading characteristic. So the missionaries lost heart, being somewhat fearful, and they sent Augustine back to Rome to try and get the project called off. Now, Gregory remained firm, however, in his original order, and I'm reminded of a chapter from the Rule of St. Benedict, that is, the chapter on assigning an impossible task to the brother, where St. Benedict says, if after the uh, explanation of of the monk, the superior is still determined to hold to his original order, then the monk must recognize that this is best for him. And trusting in God's help, he must, in love, obey. And that's what St. Augustine did. And went back to Gaul. Uh, And here I must confess the the chronology is not entirely clear to me. But it, it appears that he got back to Gaul around July of 596. Now, at this point, there are primary sources that we can rely on, not many of them, but uh, enough to give us a picture. Uh, in particular, the letters of St. Gregory, and the letters come, uh, have been organized in a register, a registrum, organized according to the year of his pontificate. So from the sixth year 
of his pontificate, we have a number of letters that I'll describe in just a moment. In addition to the letters of Gregory, we have the Ecclesiastical History of St. Bede, which uh, not only gives Bede's summary of these events, but also includes uh, quotes from letters of Gregory uh, to, to various people. So those are the two sources I'm drawing on, uh, the letters of Gregory himself and Bede's Ecclesiastical History. Uh, Bede, now the, the thing is that uh, the, the registrum of the letters that we have, uh, which have been recently edited in a critical edition, they don't pretend to be complete. It's not everything that Gregory, uh, all the letters that Gregory wrote. Many have been lost. And it seems that St. Bede was able to, uh, uh, his sources provided some of the letters that we don't have in the, in the registrum. So you need both sources to get a, a, a more complete picture. Uh, when Gregory sent Augustine back to Gaul, he sent a letter with him to the other 40 monks who were uh, trembling there in southern France, hoping to go back to, to Italy. And this is what Gregory wrote to them. Gregory, servant of the servants of God, to the servants of our Lord. Latin letters always began with the, the name of the one writing the letter and to whom it was addressed, and then, then it proceeds. My very dear sons, it is better never to undertake any high enterprise than to abandon it when once begun. So with the help of God, you must carry out this holy task which you have begun. Do not be deterred by the troubles of the journey or by what men say. Be constant and zealous in carrying out this enterprise, which under God's guidance you have undertaken. And be assured that the, that the greater the labor, the greater will be the glory of your eternal reward. When Augustine, your leader, returns, whom we have appointed your abbot, obey him humbly in all things, remembering that whatever he directs you to do will always be to the good of your souls. May Almighty God protect you with his grace and grant me to see the result of your labors in our heavenly home. And although my office prevents me from working at your side, yet because I long to do so, I hope to share in your joyful reward. God keep you safe, my dearest sons. Dated the 23rd of July, 596. Uh, this letter doesn't give us very much information about Augustine, their way of life, and their personal example. Two years pass, and in July of 598, we have another letter of St. Gregory, not to Augustine, but to the Bishop of Alexandria in Egypt, uh, named Eulogius. And in this letter of Gregory to, to uh, the Bishop of Alexandria, Gregory brags about the English missionaries. He's very proud of them. He says to the Bishop of Alexandria, uh, using flowery compliments, I know that you rejoice with others in all the good works which you accomplish, and so I return the favor to you and announce to you similar things. And now he explains. For while the people of the Angles, located in a remote corner of the world, I apologize, but that's what he said. It all depends on where the center is, isn't it, whether it's remote or far. They have remained pagan up until now in their worship of wood and stone. But with the help of your prayers, he says to the Bishop of Alexandria, it pleased me that I should send to that people a monk of my monastery, that is Augustine, for preaching with the help of God. And he explains that he made him a bishop and that now he has had a report from England. Now letters have reached me concerning Augustine's health and activity that he and those who were sent with him to that people shine forth with so many miracles that they are seen to imitate the powers of the apostles in the signs which they accomplish. For on the solemnity of the Lord's birth, more than 10,000 angles evangelized by him were baptized by this same brother of ours and fellow bishop. Now, whether in fact there were 10,000 
uh, it's hard to tell. Numbers are often exaggerated in these ancient documents. But Gregory is enormously impressed and very grateful uh, at this missionary success. That's in 598. Three years later, in June of 601, we have a letter of Gregory to Augustine, a very long letter, uh, which is very beautiful, and so I'm going to quote from it at some length. We see in this letter a spiritual instruction from a spiritual father, urging interior humility in the face of exterior miracles. Gregory is afraid that the miracles are going to go to Augustine's head, and he'll get proud. This is the longest and the most extensive correspondence we have between the two men, and it's very beautiful. Uh, St. Gregory begins with praise to God for the conversion of the Angles, and begins citing Luke's Gospel, Gloria in excelsis Deo et in terra pax hominibus bone voluntatis. That's how he begins his letter. And says, who could recount adequately how great is the joy of, in the heart of all the faithful here in Rome for the fact that the race of the Angles, by the power of the grace of Almighty God, and by the efforts of your fraternity, that is, Augustine, have been filled with the light of the holy faith. Gregory acknowledges that Augustine has worked miracles, but Gregory stresses that these miracles came about by the power of God. And he, he says, God deigned to work great things among the people of the Angles by means of weak men. But precisely because of this heavenly gift, dearest brother, that we need to cultivate, uh, because of this heavenly gift, that is the miracles, we need to cultivate, together with joy, the greatest reverential fear. I know, in fact, that God Almighty has worked great miracles by means of you. So we should have joy because the souls of the angles, by means of exterior miracles, have been brought to interior grace. Uh, Gregory plays on this exterior-interior theme, not only here but in other writings. So we have joy because of this, but we should have fear also, lest the weak soul of Augustine, through these signs which take place, rise up in personal presumption, and while honored exteriorly, fall into vainglory interiorly. It remains, dearest brother, that you, in the midst of the works which you accomplish exteriorly, with the help of God, always judge yourself carefully in your heart, and distinguish attentively who you are, and how great is the grace of God among that people, for whose conversion you have even been given the gift of working miracles. Examine yourself. Remember who you are. If perchance you remember to have neglected our Creator, either in speech or in deed, recall these things always to your memory, so that the memory of your faults might reign in vainglory, which rises up in your heart, and whatever power you will receive in the future, or have already received in terms of working miracles, you must hold that they are gifts of God, not for you, but for these people. These powers have been given you for their salvation. It's kind of a treatise on humility. And to stress uh, his point, Gregory uses the model of Moses, who worked miracles, but because of his lack of faith at Meribah, Nasa in Meribah, when he uh, struck the rock, but struck it twice because he didn't believe that God could actually bring water from this rock, because of this lack of faith, he wasn't able to enter into the promised land. And Gregory says, we should ponder how much fear, how much we should fear the judgment of Almighty God, who did so many, many miracles by means of that servant of his, Moses, but who remembered his fault even after many years, and applies this to Augustine. So you need to control your soul carefully, even in the midst of signs and wonders, 
so that it doesn't happen that you seek your own glory in these things and rejoice with a selfish joy and exaltation. I say these things because I desire that the soul of my listener should prostrate itself in humility. But let your humility be confident, he says. We might say, well, gee, he could be a little bit more complimentary or more encouraging or something, but he's concerned with the, the, the highest of all monastic virtues, that is humility. In closing, Gregory turns to the theme of his opening words, that is joy. If there was such great joy in heaven over one repentant sinner, referring to the gospel, how much greater joy do we think there will be for such a numerous people converted from its error? And thus he, he concludes this long letter. In the same month, Gregory writes another letter to Augustine, this time a more official one, not so personal, conferring on him the dignity of the pallium, that is, the, the office of archbishop or metropolitan with authority over other bishops, and says, because the new church of the Angles has been led to the grace of Almighty God by the help of the Lord and by your labors, we grant you the use of the pallium, to be worn only on solemnities, however. By granting this authority, you can ordain 12 bishops in various places who will be under your jurisdiction. And at the end of this letter, he says, may these bishops uh, take the example from you for believing rightly, that is, doctrine, and for living well, morals, so faith and morals. May they take the example from you, that is, by your words and by your way of life. That's in June of 601. I remember Gregory dies in 604, so we're, we're toward the end uh, of his pontificate. Uh, those are the only letters that we have in the registrum from Gregory to Augustine. But St. Bede... Uh, has a long chapter in which he uh, copies uh, a letter from his own sources, a long letter of Gregory, which responds to various questions that St. Augustine posed to him. As I say, it's not found in the main collection of Gregory's letters, uh, and therefore some scholars question its authenticity, and others consider it to be authentic. Well, I have no, I have no way to make those judgments myself, because uh, I I'm not familiar with uh, the arguments, but it's been handed on to us by Bede, and it's worth our consideration. And I gave you a handout with the questions that Augustine um, posed to St. Gregory. I'll give you a summary of the replies, not in great detail. First of all, what is to be the relations between the bishop and his clergy? The answer is the common life. That is, having been trained under monastic rule, you should not live apart from your clergy in the church of the English. And here we see the origin of a particularly English phenomenon that is of bishop, of a monk serving as the cathedral chapter, electing the bishop from among their, the community uh, so that you have these monastic communities staffing a cathedral uh, as, it, as uh, canons would in other, in other sections of Europe. So uh, August, uh, Gregory is urging the common life, that is the bishop living together with his clergy, uh, as we see in North Africa with uh, Augustine of Hippo. Secondly, how are the offerings made by the faithful at the altar to be apportioned? What do we do with the money? And uh, Gregory replies, all the money received is to be allocated under four headings. You see that Gregory is a great administrator. One part to the bishop and his household. One part to the clergy. The third part to the poor. And the fourth part for the upkeep of the churches. So it's a very balanced way of, uh, of uh, 
being a good steward of the monies received. Thirdly, that is part C under, under the first question, what are the functions of a bishop in his church? Gregory simply refers to the pastoral letters of St. Paul to Timothy and Titus and says, you'll find the pastoral guidelines that you need in the scriptures. Now, I'm summarizing, of course. You, you can read it yourself. It's uh, book one, uh, chapter 27 of, uh, of St. Pete. Second question, quite interesting. Since we hold the same faith, why do customs vary in different churches? Why, for, is, for instance, does the method of saying Mass differ in the Holy Roman Church and the churches of Gaul? Well, Augustine spent about a year traveling through Gaul, so he experienced what they did there. And uh, we're in the 6th century. The Gallican uh, liturgy is, uh, is still strong. It takes a couple hundred more years for it to weaken and for the Roman liturgy to take precedence for various reasons. Uh, but at this time, the Gallican liturgy was still intact. And Augustine could see, well, boy, they do things differently than we do. Gregory responds, If you have found customs whether in the Church of Rome or of Gaul or any other church that may be more acceptable to God, I wish you to make a careful selection of them and teach them to the Church of the English. Therefore, select from each of the churches whatever things are devout, religious, and right. So you see a kind of a broad-mindedness and flexibility uh, that here's a missionary church, a new church, <laughs> And depending on local conditions and local customs, uh, you can choose what is best, and uh, everything doesn't have to be a carbon copy of what we do in Rome. Number three, what punishment should be awarded to those who rob churches? Well, we should ask uh, Father Richard what punishments are afflicted here when people yeah, steal from the church. Boy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, Gregory is much kinder because he says... The punishment should depend on the circumstances of the offender. And he distinguishes between someone who steals out of poverty and someone who steals out of greed. And he says, whatever the punishment is, it should be administered in charity and not in anger. So you see a real pastor of souls who has to deal with uh, uh, the, the to punishment of crimes, uh, but with a very balanced kind of approach. Now we have some questions about a marriage law and consanguinity. Number four, it is, permiss is it permissible for two brothers to marry two sisters, provided there be no blood ties between the families? Augustine replies quite simply, uh, Gregory replies quite simply to this, saying it's quite permissible. There's nothing in Holy Scripture that seems to forbid it. So his norm is the Scripture. Here's a question about pastoral life. Where do we find the answer? Refer to the scriptures. The next one is a bit more complicated. Uh, number five. To what degree of, of consanguinity may the faithful marry with their kindred? And is it lawful for a man to marry his stepmother or sister-in-law? Uh, to summarize a long uh, answer... Gregory says, in response to the first question, uh, necessity forbids a closer marriage than that between the third or fourth degree. While the second degree, uh, he says simply, to wed one's stepmother is a grave sin, and he uses scripture once again as his norm. Uh, however, there's something important in this section, because uh, Augustine has to deal with messy marriage situations of the people that he's uh, evangelizing. And Gregory realizes that, and, and uh, there's the question of whether these people in a messy marriage situation should receive communion or not. We think that's a question today. It is. It was a question back then, too. Uh, Gregory says, since there are many among the English who, while they were still heathen, uh, have contracted these unlawful marriages, when they accept the faith, they are to be instructed that this is a grave offense and they must abstain from it. 
warn them of the terrible judgment of God, and so on. Nevertheless, they are not on that account to be, tri- to be deprived of the communion of the body and blood of Christ, lest they appear to be punished for sins committed unknowingly before they receive the purification of baptism. For in these days, that is, in a missionary situation, the Church corrects some things strictly and allows others out of leniency. Others, again, she deliberately glosses over and tolerates, and by so doing, often succeeds in choking an evil of which she disapproves. So he shows a remarkable sensitivity uh, and prudence, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, that is sometimes you act severely and sometimes you act leniently, and the purpose is to win the people over to the gospel, which has to be preached in its integrity. Uh, But there's uh, this great sensitivity to to the people, especially in terms of how they were living before baptism and how they were living after baptism. Uh, Question 6 returns to um, ecclesiastical polity. If a long journey is involved so that bishops cannot easily assemble, is it permissible for a bishop to be consecrated without other bishops being present? Because the norm is three. And uh, Gregory responds, In the Church of the English, where as yet you are the only bishop, you cannot do otherwise than consecrate a bishop without any other bishops being present. Very practical. (laughs) Because to go to Gaul was too far away, uh, just a a very long journey, or to get bishops from Gaul to come over to, uh, to England. He continues, When in God's good time bishops are appointed in various places at no great distance from one another, no consecration is to take place except in the presence of three or four bishops. So there's a provision made in a, as a temporary solution in view of a, the, the stabilization and normalization of things with time. Seven, what are to be our relations with the bishops of Gaul and Britain? I'm not sure what he means by Britain here. Uh, you, you know better than I when he's talking about the angles, he's talking about just that eastern part, and there are other parts of, of uh, the, island, so. the whole thing. Okay. Um, because he just said there was only he, that Augustine was the only Briton, only Briton, only bishop. Now it seems like there are other bishops. He's envisaging well, this is what he says: For Gaul, we give you no authority over the bishops of Gaul. For since the time of my early predecessors, the bishop of Arles has received the pallium. He may be in Brittany. He might, that's why I wondered. But, he says, all the bishops of Britain, however, we commit to your charge. I'm I'm not sure, as I say, what, what exactly that means. Use your authority to instruct the unlearned, unlearned bishops, that is, to strengthen the weak, bishops, and correct the misguided bishops. That is, the metropolitan has to guide and lead the other bishops that are under him. It could be, it could be. Number eight. Uh, Eight and nine have to do with ritual purity. A long question Uh, May an an expectant mother be baptized? How soon after childbirth may she enter the church? Uh, How soon after birth may a child be baptized? Um, I won't go into all of these things because um, basically Gregory responds saying, well, use your good sense and uh, and act in favor of the person and uh, don't get too concerned about Old Testament laws of ritual purity, which the New Testament uh, uh, purifies. Uh, It's a long response because people were very concerned about those things. They're they're practical things about everyday life. Uh, Number nine also refers to uh, ritual purity. May a man receive communion after a sexual illusion in a dream, or if a priest, may he celebrate the holy mysteries. Uh, And so uh, uh, Gregory responds also to those questions with 
a great deal of subtlety, uh, speaking especially about the state of a man's soul and the state of a man's thoughts, not simply his physical purity or lack of physical purity. Let me uh, make some comments in synthesis and then uh, conclude. There are three great themes here, I think. One is missionary method. Another is the relation between Gregory and Augustine. And a third is these, these pastoral questions. In terms of missionary method, we've seen that uh, the monastic common life is key. The liturgy and public devotions is key, and preaching. Uh, that's not what we usually think of today when we think of missionary work. We think of social action and uh, taking care of the poor and establishing schools and doing all these things which uh, flow from the original commitment of prayer and Christian life. So that's the missionary method. Secondly, the relation between Augustine and Gregory. In this correspondence, the personality of Augustine doesn't really emerge, uh, except that he's someone in whom Gregory has great confidence. He's a servant of God, full of zeal and dedication, a good example uh, who uh, is uh, to be imitated in terms of his teaching and his morals. What does emerge, however, is the personality of St. Gregory, who comes off as a wise pastor, a spiritual master and guide, concerned about the interior life of the missionaries and monastic virtue. In terms of the pastoral questions, there are themes of ecclesiology, and perhaps one of the most interesting things is the common life of the clergy. Uh, He's interested in morality and shows firmness in the church's teaching, but with the idea of a gradual transformation of the society by the gospel. In terms of the liturgy, we see the evangelizing power of the liturgy and also his uh, awareness of pluralism in the church's liturgical practice. Uh, Gregory is really... Um, Magnus, Gregory, Gregory the Great. He's really, he's really great. Conclusions. Uh, different, depending on how you read these texts, different uh, groups of people will be able to glean different insights from this correspondence between Gregory and Augustine. Uh, for me, the most interesting aspect is the missionary method. That is, uh, monk missionaries witness above all by their monastic life, by liturgy, and by preaching. In Norcia, uh, even though we're in uh, what used to be a Catholic country, uh, we certainly have the uh, awareness that we are missionary monks also. We're missionary monks from three different continents, from Europe, from Asia, and from North and South America. In this uh, missionary effort of ours, if I can put it that way, we have many friends and supporters. Uh, today we're commemorating the 10th anniversary of the English Friends of Norcia, a trust established uh, here in, in Oxford, 10 years ago, which has a, a very important role to play, both in terms of financial support and vocational promotion. Now, in the 6th century, uh, help came to England uh, by way of the monks that Gregory sent uh, with Augustine at their head. Uh, and now uh, we have help going the other way. There is help from England uh, going back to, uh, to Italy uh, in terms of the support and uh, encouragement uh, we receive from the, the, the English friends of Norcia uh, to our uh, young and growing community. So we're very grateful for that support. And I want to say also that here there are friends that I've met some years ago. Some of you have come to pilgrimage, uh, on pilgrimage to Norcia. And there are some Americans here whom I met 20 years ago uh, at their father's ordination, uh, a monk of uh, St. Bede's Abbey in Peru, Illinois, 
who entered the monastery after his wife died, uh, and I attended his ordination. It was 20 years ago, and uh, and I'm very happy to see you here. That's that's really wonderful. So you see, uh, the world is small and interconnected, uh, and uh, that's a gift of the Holy Spirit too. Thank you for your uh, attention, and we. Uh, what's the next thing? Time for questions? Or? Father Cassian, thank you very much. <laughs> there were some re refreshments, and the monks included among the refreshments. And the monks have recently begun a new venture. They make their own beer. <laughs> a, 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 a light, refreshing beer for a summer evening, and a dark, dark, strong beer to help you sleep. And there is, will be some of that available, plus some wine and a cup of tea and coffee. But before we get to that, I think Father Kesson will answer a few questions if anybody has any. Yes. Um, you say you said forty monks. Uh, what is the total strength of the Benedictine Order at the time? Well, um, at the time there wasn't a Benedictine Order. That is, these monks came from the single monastery of uh, St. Andrews on the Chalian Hill in, in Rome. The, um, we can't say with any certainty if they followed the rule of Benedict or not, probably not. That is, things weren't quite that developed yet. And it wasn't considered as, as an order with a central kind of government. That is, there were lots of monasteries, but each monastery had its own customary, which governed its life, drawing from different rules, uh, so things didn't become more uh, structured in a centralized sort of way until the Carolingian period. But to have 40 monasteries from that monastery in Rome, well, there are other, St. Leo, who dies in 460, so over 100 years before Gregory, established various monasteries attached to the basilicas, the major basilicas of Rome, to serve the liturgical needs of those uh, Basilicas. So there were lots of monasteries in Rome, but they weren't Benedictine per se at this time. Yes? I just wondered the 40 monks who came over to England, did they stay? Was that it? Did they ever go back to Italy? Or were they from then on really English? I don't, uh, I don't have any information about that. Uh, what would the norm have been? They, they, they would have. And that yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah. In general. That's it's quite not well, there was the spirit in those days, uh, or, or even perhaps later it's more common, that you, you go into, um, into a foreign land out of love for Christ and never return home. That is being a, a, a pilgrim for Christ. Uh, there's a lot of that in terms of English, later on, of English monks leaving England to go to the continent and never going back. Uh, so it was a, the, perhaps the, the hardest kind of sacrifice to leave your your family and your land and go to a foreign place full of Christ. 